Section 4A, Unit 4A, dealt with the environmental analysis. What's going on out in the world that can help us, hinder us, provide opportunities, and are we geared to take advantage of those opportunities? Okay, so that's the first thing that we looked at. In this particular one, we're saying, okay, now that we've assessed the opportunities out there in the world and the threats, and, and we think about, you know, what kind of things can we do that potentially can generate some money for us? We're at a stage now where we say, okay, let's look at, sit down, please. Sit down. He doesn't like me talking. Um, let's think about what we need to manipulate in our business in order to capture that opportunity. And when we talk about manipulating things in the marketing world, we're looking at four basic elements. The product itself, does the product meet the needs of the customer is the ultimate question that's answered. And we have to communicate to the customer that we do have a product that meets their needs. The second issue that we need to look at from a point of view of the market is, okay, what would be the issue with regards to where it's sold, how we distribute it, what we call the place function. How are we going to get it to you? How are you going to come to see us? Where are we going to be located? Are we next to the customer? Are we far away from the customer? What do we do in terms of distribution and these sorts of issues? Next, we need to look at the price. What are we doing with regards to the price? Is it a higher price than what consumers would be willing to pay? A lower price? Is it right on? Do we want to give some perception of the quality of product based on the price? It's a challenging issue, this idea of putting a price on an item. And finally, we look at the promotion. How do we promote it? in such a way that we can let customers know potentially that this product exists. So yesterday we did a very quick summary of the marketing mix. And again, I'm doing it very quickly because you have covered it before. This is nothing new to you. So uh, the product, what do we have to do with the product? What are some of the things that has to be done with the product and what does it from our point of view here in this particular course, what do we need to demonstrate in the marketing plan component of the business plan? So ultimately, what do we need to do in the business plan to tell people who read this and to think about from ourselves, what is it we're going to do in order to market this product successfully? Okay, so if we're thinking about the product, we got to think about developing what the product is. So we have to ask yourself, what the heck are we selling? And what need is it meeting? So we really have to clarify that in our marketing plan, which is part of the business plan. We also got to think about more uh, operational type considerations, like how's the product gonna be manufactured? Are we gonna manufacture it offshore? If, we're, if it's a manufactured product, that is. Are we getting it made in China somewhere? Who's making it? How are we going to do that? You know, what are some of those things? If it's a service type product, how are we going to deliver the service? We also talked about this idea of the concept. And again, we've looked at this concept in marketing one and two of the life cycle. And depending on where the, the product that you're producing is in terms of its overall market life cycle, what we mean is, are people familiar with this or is this something brand new? Is it something that's been around a long time or is it something that's brand new? Is it something that consumers need to learn a lot about or is it something you already know a lot about? Are there lots of producers making this same thing or are there not? Depending on where it is on the life cycle, that's going to impact what you put in your business plan. So, for example, if we think about the life cycle, if this product is in the introduction stage of the life cycle, meaning nobody knows anything about it. Our marketing plan has to clearly demonstrate how we're going to inform people of the wonders of, and benefits of this product. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. People aren't going to, you can't assume that people are going to know what your product is all about and what solution it provides. If we're at the growth or maturity stage, which is the later stages, yeah, people are going to know about the product for sure, but there's going to be a lot of competitors out there. So we're going to think to ourselves, what makes our product stand out from our competitive products? We really need to kind of think about that. If it's in the decline stage, we really need to ask yourself, what the heck are we making this product for anyway? Because is there another product to take over from it? Is it at the end of its life? Is this something, you know, it's like trying to sell typewriters now. 
is this something people are really going to buy? So we need to be able to clearly indicate in our marketing plan, part of the business plan, where this product sits and how the strategy we're going to use in order to inform people that the product actually exists. And we always think about, you know, when we're doing that, we got to think about issues like what is the what is the major benefit of this product that we're offering over everyone else's the relative advantage we're going to look at how complex is this if this is a nuclear reactor you know we got a lot of work to do in our business plan to tell, tell people how it works if it's a if it's a piece of paper or something that's made of paper pretty simple product okay so low complexity high complexity is going to is really going to define how much work you need to do in the business plan to define what the product is and how you're going to produce it. The visibility is another thing. You know, can you do you need to buy a lot of this? Is it is it is it a product that requires huge volumes of, of things? So, for example, <clears throat> you know, if you got to buy a, a product that's worth ten thousand dollars because it got all these components, that's a big purchase for someone. Whereas if it's something that's worth hundred dollars and a relatively small part of another thing. And we got to think about the communicability of the results. I don't like the word communicability, but effectively it means how do we clearly know that the product does what it says it's going to do? So we need to demonstrate that. We look at also the type of product and we got to consider this within our business plan. You know, is it a convenience good? Is it something that everybody buys everywhere? Is it a shopping good? Is it something people got to look for, shop for, consider advantages, lots of competitors out there? Is it a specialty product? Is it a unique item that, that really needs to be defined? Or is it an unsought product? Is it something that people don't even know you need? So we looked at that. We also looked at place distribution function. When we talk about place distribution function, you know, we think about moving the product to the customer. How in the heck did we do that? Or getting the product to us to be able to move to the customer. And that, you know, depending on the product, that could be a simple task or a difficult task. And in fact, we need to think about, we need to specify in our marketing plan how we're going to get the product to the customer, or how we're going to get the raw materials to us. So we think about, you know, if we talk about this channel of how the product, let's let's just look at it from the manufacturer to the customer. Okay, let's just look at that end of it. If if we think about that, we ask ourselves, what is the route that that goes to the customer? And we call this route the channel. The channel is the flow in which the product goes the flow in which the product goes it could be a short channel a short channel means that the product goes straight from the manufacturer to the customer directly no one's involved now that involves you can say well that's pretty simple that's easy well as a manufacturer are you set up for distribution do you have that or you know is that something you'd rather someone else do because that's a big job in and of itself if you think about you know you're you're busy trying to make stuff and then you got to do up parcels to put it up and put it through the mail maybe you're not interested in doing that you maybe you should focus on building stuff and then get someone else to, to ship it through the mail or you know is it a direct channel or is it a, a less direct channel meaning that it goes through the wholesaler or some form of intermediary that's going to have an impact on how the product is sold and it's something that your marketing plan needs to deal with we're also talking about things like the channel intensity you know does it require a lot of selling effort? Is it a, a product that requires extensive knowledge? Do we need extensive, smart, well-educated, well-connected salespeople to sell this because it is such a complicated product? We also think about things like the price. We've got to consider these factors. How much are we going to charge for this? So price is, is really hard because, particularly in services, because you don't know what to charge for. I mean, is there a, a value that you put on things? You charge too high for it. Do you charge too low for it? There is a risk. If you charge too low, you're not making a lot of money. You're not making any money. You're selling really low. If you charge too high, probably no one's going to buy from you. So you really need to think about that. So you you really need to in your marketing. You need to be able to say, this is the price we're charging and why we're charging that price. The why is so critical. It's not sufficient to say, and, and that really needs to. Be based on some evidence and there's lots of influences on price external to the business you know this is what 
other competitors are charging. This is what the industry norm is, for example. That's an external influence. We also have internal influences. What does it cost for us to make this product? And if you think internal influences, you got to make enough money to cover your costs. Otherwise, you'll go out of business. And we talked about the various pricing. You know, we've done this in marketing before, so I just glazed over this. We talk about cost plus pricing, which is we know our costs, and we just add, say, 10% on our cost. Voila, that comes up with our price. So cost plus is simple, simple, simple. The fact is, it may not give us a good competitive price because if our costs are huge and we charge a little bit more, our prices are going to be huge. And if our competitors are not charging that price and they're selling essentially the same product, we're not going to be in business. So cost-based pricing is good in the sense that it's simple, but it's not so good in that it doesn't really define if the product is viable to be sold, we'll call it. Because if your costs are huge and you go to sell it and there's lots of competitors out there selling exactly the same type of product for a lot less, no one's going to buy from you. And we got demand-based pricing, which is saying, you know, which is really what most of the world works on. If there's a high demand for the product, you can afford to charge higher prices. Low demand, lower prices. This is exactly what we talked about in economics, you know. Supply and demand have a huge influence on price. You look at gas prices, for example, now. Gas prices have nowhere to go but up. Why? Well, first of all, we've got the taxation regime put on it because of the environmental concern, number one. But number two, look at world events. COVID's on the go. It's reducing people's ability, increasing uncertainty. We've got a war going on over there in Ukraine now. That's making people nervous. Whenever that happens, we say to ourselves, wow, that's dangerous. People are going to want to gather stuff up. Demand for the product is going to go up. The supply of the product might go down. A lot of oil comes out of Russia. Listen, if, if supply goes down, demand goes up, prices, where do they go? Up. Competition-based pricing is important because if we work in an environment where there's lots of competitors, so for example, depending on where we are in the, on the life cycle, you know, in this maturity and growth, growth and maturity stage, we end up with lots of competition out there. Your pricing needs to reflect your competitors because otherwise nobody's going to buy from you, especially if you have a product that is hard to differentiate from what your competitors are selling. So you need to really reflect that in your business plan. The last element is promotion. We need to think about how do we communicate to the customer that we have the product for sale. So promotion is very important. And if we think about most businesses today have to effectively communicate because we live in a world of thousands of items. There are no shortages of items. How do you make yours stand out? So we think about how we do this. How can we make our stand out? So in marketing and within our business plan, our marketing plan within our business plan, the best way to do this is to use a systematic process of defining how and why and where you're going to promote your items. It's a seven step process. You might find in some, some, some journals it might be six, some might be five, might be 10. But the fact is, it is a process that involves a number of steps. Here, I have seven steps. The very first thing we need to do in anything we do is to clearly outline what are our objectives. What is it we want to achieve? Do we want high sales? Do we want high, you know, to make a lot of money? Is it something we want to sell very fast? Is it something we, we want to get a very broad brush of the market? Do we want, you know, many people to understand that it exists and buy it? Are we looking for a very specific customer? So we need to clearly outline our objectives. What is it we want to do? These objectives must be, like all objectives, something that are specific, measurable, attainable, realistically, and time-based. We need to think about the target of the promotion. Who are we selling this to? It's pointless to say anyone and everyone. That's not a target strategy. We need to be able to focus our efforts on specific groups of customers that will provide the best return for the minimum investment. That means we need to selectively pick. These are the folks that we're going to speak to because we can't speak to everyone. It's like a, a spreadshot type of view. It's not very focused. 
We need to focus our efforts to a specific group of customers. We got to identify what that specific group is. That's the challenge. But in your marketing plan, within your business plan, that target audience is going to be important to identify who is your market. People who loan you money and you are going to be critically interested in that because you're not going to be able to appeal to everybody. We got to be able to do some research onto the target market in our third section too, because what are the target customers needs? We clearly need to back up the target market that we're picking based on the fact that they are the ones that have the needs that both are aligned with what we provide. We have to come up with a theme. What is it we are? The theme is uh, kind of like, um, if you had to ask someone, what is it they're selling? They should be able to sum it up in one or two words. That's what we mean by the theme. We need to determine what media we're gonna use in order to promote this. Now, there's loads of choices. There's print media, electronic media, social media, internet. There's, there's, a, there's a huge variety. You can't do all. You need to say, what are the ones that we will pick? What ones are the most effective? That effective group probably come with a cost and you're gonna to have to consider, let's pick the effective ones because our budget is only so big that we think will make the most benefit. Here's our reasoning why. And the air marketing plan has clearly indicated that. The message that we're gonna bring out, again, looking at a relevant theme, looking at a target market, it has to align with that. What is the promotional message? The budget. This is a very difficult one. This involves looking at it and saying, how much money is it going to cost to do what we plan to do? And what are the funds we have available to be able to move this forward? They need to match. If we say we're gonna buy 10,000 hours of commercials on television, and we find out that that's gonna cost $10 million and we only have $29.52, our promotional campaign is irrelevant because we'll never do it. We need to be able to say, this is our plan. This is how much money is going to cost. And here we have a capacity to spend money on that. Finally, we need, well, it's not finally, but the final action step is to implement. What are we going to do in order to bring this forward? And, uh, you know, your business plan is going to have to clearly indicate how you're going to roll this in. The last item is really being able to evaluate what is it we're looking at, how are we going to evaluate it, and how do we know if it's working effectively. So that's, you know, that's a tall order. That is a tall order for businesses, but your business plan and the marketing plan element of your business plan really has to articulate that well. If you haven't articulated that well within your business plan, anyone who's potentially gonna loan you money for this is gonna say, are you really sure you know what you're doing? Because if you have not done that, you know, that is the lifeboat of the business. Your selling, what you sell, is how your business makes money. If you have not conveyed a clear process for how you're going to sell, someone's gonna look at it and say, well, you don't have a plan. And it doesn't matter how great an idea it is, if you can't execute that, the business will never make any money and you know people will just not loan you money. So that is so absolutely critical. I just kind of touched on these points here too, because again, we've covered them all before. I just want to kind of refocus. We've got advertising out there, which is non-personal form of promotion. We're all familiar with advertising. It costs lots of money. Uh, you know, a TV advertising in particular can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Radio is less expensive, but it doesn't reach as many people. Newspapers, again, it doesn't reach a lot of people anymore. Magazines, depending on who's reading the magazine, you know, so you really need to think, if you're gonna pick a media, an advertising media, how does it align with your target market? Do your target market read newspapers? Do your target market read magazines? Do they drive? Do they go past billboards? Do they have access to the internet? Do they use the internet? It's important to be able to define, to link your advertising that you, or the, the type of advertising you use to your target market. Personal selling. 
personal selling, if you've got potentially 100,000 customers, you cannot go and speak to every single one of them. So personal selling is only really applicable for a business that deals with word of mouth, people talking to one another. You need to be able to think that this type of business is a business that has, that has high, it's a high dollar business, meaning like if you're a carpenter, you can afford to go talk to your clients about building houses because the most houses you can build during a year is probably six or seven. So you're only going to be dealing with six or seven potential customers or 10 or 12 potential customers. Yeah, you could do that. But if you're selling a product that you're going to sell millions of, personal selling is just not going to work because you can't speak to every potential customer. So again, it has to align with the type of product. Traditional promotional, you know, we think about other types of promotionals, for example, going out and looking at doing direct mail. Well, mail can be expensive. Looking in telephone directories, do we have such a thing anymore? But effectively, electronic telephone directories, calling people up can be challenging or not. You know, there are regulations with regards to how you can do this sort of thing. Newspapers, again, magazines, these sorts of things. They can be effective, but they're generally very high cost. And we need to consider what would be the most efficient type of operation. One that doesn't cost anything but costs a lot is public relations. There is no direct charge for public relations. It's just making yourself look good in the community. But there is an indirect charge. That's what I mean by it's low cost, but it's not low cost. If you're sponsoring a hockey team or if you're putting your name on products, so people will become knowledgeable about it. Or if you're, you know, doing some sort of event that you're sponsoring, you're putting a lot of money into that. So it is expensive, but you're not directly spending money on advertising as you do in advertising. So it's designed to create a positive impression for your company. Also, you got to think about PR and say, well, is that the type of, is it going to present the type of image to the customer that we want presented? problem with public relations is you could say, yeah, it does, but what if things go awry? If things go awry, you know, what is the problem? I'll give you an example of that. This is probably the greatest case of a public relations campaign going belly up pretty fast. If you're familiar with it at all, in London, there is a thing called the London Eye. And it's effectively a giant Ferris wheel that sits on the Thames River. There's a picture of it right there. That was just before it was put up. What happens? They built it in the river, such as here, and they more or less lifted it up. So now if you look at it, it, it is standing up like a normal Ferris wheel. Anyway, this uh, is a very popular tourist attraction in London, and it's a great opportunity to go out and see the city from on high. On the day, which was around 2001, on the day that uh, it was supposed to be erected, and here we go where this crane, this crane here was supposed to lift it up, they had some problems. In fact, it got so far and they had to lower it down, and it, it just didn't work. Well, that was a, a sad story because the company that sponsored the event, they had a big event around that. They asked thousands of people to come down to the Thames, watch the erection of this um, golden eye and uh, so all these people saw it not work and over the it was over a course of several hours that this problem occurred the sponsor of that day was a company called that you might be familiar with called uh, British Airways British Airways is the flag carrier of the United Kingdom okay Big company, lots of airplanes, very well known, very well respected in the industry. They wanted to produce uh, a bit of goodwill. So they did this public relations campaign of effectively sponsoring the London Eye, the raising of the London Eye. Another competing company called Virgin Airways, which is owned by Richard Branson, um, was very upset with the fact that they didn't get the opportunity to sponsor this and they were you know they were a little bit uh, there's a big rivalry between british airways and virgin airways in the uk and anyway they weren't too keen on this but on the day that this thing was supposed to be put up and the time it took to get it put up and the problems they had putting it up 
Richard Branson, who was a little bit of a cagey dude, um, realized he had a marketing opportunity here. And what he did is he hired a blimp. And here's the blimp right here. And the thing is with blimps is they're designed for advertising. So what did he write on the side of the blimp? BA can't get it up. So effectively, Virgin sponsored this and the play on words based on the fact that they couldn't get that thing raised certainly created a, a lot of uh, spin in the British media. So British Airways has spent all this money, but Virgin is the one who got the benefit out of it. So you got to be very careful of public relations because public relations can go awry pretty quick unless you have very good control because you're not controlling the message that gets out. We also have digital and internet marketing. This is the darling right now. Okay, the internet uses all kinds of digital media in order to allow you to get out. You know, if we think about the internet, it allows you photos, text, video, a whole bunch of sensory uh, abilities, plus it has the ability of, of reacting. So a lot of people will switch to this. It can get expensive. It certainly can get expensive, but on the other hand, it is highly effective as well. And a lot of companies do that. So we will find that many marketing campaigns now within many business plans have an element for digital or internet marketing. Uh, sort of like a, a, a tie into digital marketing is something called search engine optimization. And effectively what search engine optimization allows you to do is to go to the search companies, Google, Bing, Yahoo, and say to them, if you allow my result to come up when someone searches, when someone does a search on Google, Bing, or Yahoo, you know, you know yourself that items come up to the top and there are thousands of items underneath. Well, what makes an item go to the top? So I'll just switch out here and show you to demonstrate the concept of the, an element of the concept of search engine optimization. So let me search for bicycle here. I'm just searching bicycles. Now, you will notice in Google that when I go in here, I get a search result for a bicycles. But what comes up first? Bruce's Recreation, Backyard Bike Shop. Then I run into bicycles on Amazon, Costco. Well, search engine optimization means that these companies, Bruce's Recreation, for example, has paid Google an amount. So when I search for bicycle, theirs will come up on top. And so you can go and, and work with Google. And if you want to know about Google Ads, there's all kinds of information online on Google Ads that allow your items to come up top. Now, it's it can be expensive. It works on the basis of clicks as opposed to a flat charge. If people click on your item, so for example, I've searched it here, I've not clicked on Bruce's Recreation, they're not paying any money for this. <coughs> the moment I click on it, Google has, will send a bill to Brian Wiseman for me going to this. And you can see that it comes with some information there. So that's how search engine optimization works in its very crudest, rudimentary step. When we think of it, Mobile marketing has become so important. Now you can see how much it's grown in, this is the amount of growth in the last number of years, 2014, 26%, 15% growth, 6.1% growth. The pandemic has even grown it further. What does it mean? What does market mobile marketing mean? What it means is when I have a cell phone, you will know, and if you don't know, your phone has a GPS in it. In other words, it knows exactly where you are in the world at any point in time. That GPS information is important. First of all, companies like Google track it. So Google knows every, I can go back and look at my Google, my, my Google, and it will tell me where I was on any given day and what I did on that given day. That has some big brother scariness to it, but it also has some benefits. Because from a marketing point of view, theoretically, when I go to Canadian Tire, I don't know if your phone is set up like mine, when I go to Canadian Fire, Tire, 
I will get a message after I come from Canadian Tire that says, how was your experience in Canadian Tire? Or how was your experience in Wolcott? Or Walmart, <laughs> sorry. How was your experience in uh, Jungle Gyms? Mobile marketing is very, very, become very important because with the technology, the phone knows where it is. So you can actually market as someone walks or drive past your shop, you can actually get the message or get that delivered to your phone. So, you know, it, it really has so many, op, so many, uh, there are so many abilities of mobile marketing that it is, as I say, a course in and of itself. But suffice to say that this type of promotional activity is hugely growing. Okay, here's what I want to look at this morning. I just wanted to demonstrate, use this as demonstrate. Again, I'm sticking with my theme of the Newfoundland Labrador Tourism. I know it's not a small business, but they do have a very clearly articulated marketing plan for the province. So I'm using that as a basis of which to demonstrate here. So what I wanted to do was to go through the basic steps that we described for the promotional campaign. So Newfoundland Labrador Tourism Ministry has developed an issue to really promote itself over the next number of years. And, you know, even though Newfoundland Labrador is not really a small business, it is a business. If we think of the province, it's a $10 billion a year business. So we're going to re review uh, their well-documented strategy. So this is like their, their marketing plan. We're looking at elements of their marketing plan for developing Newfoundland Labrador tourism. And this is the major document for it. It's called Uncommon Potential. I got it linked here. It is a um, master document that describes the government's plan for, uh, for moving forward. Okay. Here are the steps that we were looking at. And as I say, there's a seven key steps, but there's the, 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 the kind of the evaluation stage as well. So we got, I'm going to say, let's say there's nine issues here that we're going to look at. Setting promotional objectives. What is the very first thing? Well, if you look at their opening commentary in that document, it says our strategic approach is informed by Vision 2020, which was a plan that was laid out back in the early 2010s to say where is Newfoundland going to be by 2020. Okay, it's a it's a original planning document, which provides a blueprint for industrial industry growth. It also based on strong foundation of knowledge, experience, and insights in relation to tourism and tur travel landscape, as well as primary research, including visit visitor expert, expert surveys, the uh, TAMS, which is the Tourism Association surveys that are being done. Basically, they're done at hotels and the like. Statistics and tourism marketing publications and travel reports. So the first issue that comes out of this is Promotional objectives, okay? That's the very first thing you need to do. What has the province done in order to set the promotional objectives? Well, they very clearly articulate it. Across all new plan lab, our tours and marketing initiatives, we aim to improve our critical marketing objectives, including increase new plan lab tourism visitation and expenditures annually, build on new plan Labrador's brand awareness in priority markets, Increase tourism brand engagement and build traveler advocacy for Newfoundland and Labrador. If you've been here, you talk about how wonderful it was effectively. Move the target audience of potential experience or travelers from awareness to interest. So one of the things that we have to do in terms of marketing is we have to first create awareness. I didn't know Newfoundland and Labrador exists. Now I do. To interest to say, hey, I'd like to go there. And then we need to bring them to action. I'm on the plane and I'm headed here. Okay. So that's kind of like the stages of awareness. I didn't know it existed. Now I do. I'm interested. I'd like to go there. I plan to go there. I did go there. So we think about, um, if we think about to determine the target of the promotion, they do clearly lay that out here too. Who are the visitors and what are they looking for? The research that they've done has clearly articulated this. For Newfoundland and Labrador, there's no such thing as an accidental terrorist. It takes a deliberate action to visit here. Compelled by curiosity and the promise of what's unique and different in our culture, history, lifestyle, and dramatic scenery. Our research confirms the typical touring, touring and explorer travels or comes to Newfoundland and Labrador are singles and couples aged 45 and above, so no kids, well-educated, high average income, Looking to discover the unusual, exotic, knowledgeable, experienced, and curious travelers. 
seeking a broad range of authentic quality tourism experiences, expecting to receive value for money, and primarily in Ontario, Alberta, English-speaking Quebec maritime secondary markets include the United States and the United Kingdom. As well, more than 81% of the visitors are Canadian, and specifically from Ontario, 50%, followed by the Maritimes, Alberta, and British Columbia, 13%, and our visitors from the United States, primarily the New England states, uh, Massachusetts and the like, and uh, mid-Atlantic states. So we're going down the eastern seaboard generally, while 9% are from international markets, primarily the UK and Germany. So they've clearly articulated who the primary target markets are and the secondary target markets. What are the tourist needs and perceptions of the product or service? So, you know, we, we've gone out, we've done a lot of research. Why do they think about it? Newfoundland Labrador's Find Yourself Here campaign has been hugely successful in a position in the province, a unique exotic destination, having continued to win major national and international awards. The campaign has brought unprecedented levels of awareness to Newfoundland Labrador. Our target remains on the explorator, explorer market, sophisticated travelers looking for a natural and exotic experience off the beaten path. A visit here is a chance to meet our people, interact with our dramatic, remarkable landscape and experience the creative of our culture firsthand. The marketing campaign showcases who we really are, a natural yet surprisingly exotic destination that goes beyond the packaged plastic tourism experience, the Newfoundland, not Disneyland experience, and so many other destinations. It is a combination of people, culture, and dramatic rugged landscape that gives Newfoundland a unique position in tourism as a tourism destination. So this is what the target needs and perceptions are that they're meeting. Four, develop a relevant theme. So what have they done in order to link up to that, given those things, what have we done? Well, what we've done is created what's called a brand personality. The Newfoundland Lab Tourism brand personality personifies and brings to life visually and in attitude and language the creative of our people and culture. The Newfoundland Labrador brand personality is a natural and spontaneous expression of who we are. Natural and uncomplicated, warm and friendly, genuine, authentic, quiet and proudly independent, spontaneous rather than practiced and self-conscious, witty and funny with natural spontaneity, creative, not only in arts and culture, but in natural ingenuity and inventiveness. Our brand promise, what are we selling? What is it that people come here, what do we promise them? Tourism brand promise that Newfoundland Labrador is a chance to discover a wonderful, natural, exotic, and unexpected different place off the beaten track. Perhaps most importantly, a visit here is an opportunity for visitors to discover something inside themselves. It's not your usual. The brand themes rooted in our creative pillars and our brand's unique selling propositions, USP, and icons, travel motivators, our key experiences, and our key themes are creative, colorful people and culture, including unique place names, unique time zone, colorful character, and so on. Natural environment, unique geology, like the Tablelands, Torngat Mountains National Park, Gross Morn, Mistaken Point, Tuckamore, Barrens, Mountains, Four Corners of the Earth, Most Easterly Point in North America, 29,000 kilometers of coastline, whales, icebergs, hiking and walking, seabird capital of North America, wildlife, plants and berries, etc. Heritage and history, unique English, Irish, French, and indigenous heritage, Dictionary of Newfoundland English, home of the oldest European settlement in North America, oldest city in North America, Four UNESCO heritage sites, historical experiences such as Red Bay, Battle Harbor, Lance Meadows, Signal Hill, the rooms, etc. So very clearly, that's what we find in all the advertising. If you think about the advertising, does it reflect those? Yes, it matches it. Determine the method or media to use. So, and I've combined a couple here, uh, develop a specific promotional message. So uh, if you look at this particular uh, article right here, that was Media in Canada, they talk about this issue of what is the method media choice, why is that the choice, and what is the promotional message? So I've just pulled out, this is Target Marketing who does this campaign. Uh, 
We've been trying to reach an affluent audience in Canada to travel to Newfoundland. Just to give you an example, the weekend edition of the Globe and Mail has a readership of 1.7 million people. Why would I ignore the opportunity to reach 1.7 million people? It checks a lot of the boxes in terms of who we want to attract here. Creativity, it's a beautiful format. Very few media channels that give us the canvas like that. So the province buys ads, full page ads. Here is the ad that appeared in Globe Mail. Full page ads in Globe Mail. Very expensive. Very, very expensive. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars to put it in Globe Mail, but it's in front of 1.7 million eyeballs. The digital piece is a mix of premium partners and uh, programmatic placement. So this effectively means that it's online. You'll find it on websites. And it, again, looking at highlighting these very same things. Um, the 2020, this is from 2020, the 2020 tourism ad included 15 print ads, TV, digital, and social media. So that's where we're headed. And, you know, the specific promotional message, again, something different. Now, it's almost impossible to get detailed budgets for Newfoundland and Labrador, but here are the, the broad strokes of the budget, okay, in terms of $13 million for tourism marketing. That's how much the province spends on that. Now, you say, well, that's a lot of money, but relative to the provincial budget of $10 billion, that's not a lot of money. Um, eligible under tourism and hospitality, sport program will expand and include. Um, so, you know, that's direct tourism marketing, but also things like Hudson and Ricks, things like um, Republic of Doyle when it was on, things like uh, the Mark Critch show, uh, Son of a Critch, those things are all sponsored by the province's tourism organization too, because what it does is one of the main characters in those shows is mostly St. John's, but the province. And that is a huge tourism vehicle. And the province puts a lot of money into television and film production. So right now, Hudson and Rex, for example, the province puts, I think, a million dollars a year into that. So these are the types of things that what the province is doing. That's not what we consider traditional advertising, but needless to say, it is expensive and it is part of the promotion. Uh, cultural economic development, they've got about uh, three and a half million bucks in that. Uh, Arts and L, they're putting money in that. Craft breweries. So this is what the province has put their money into in terms of the total promotional budget. And it's not just your traditional advertising. That's the key message that I want to put here. To be successful, Newfoundland and Labrador tourism focuses and concentrates uh, its limited budget dollars and resources on the best opportunity possible. It creates a full integrated program of campaigns that move potential travelers through the travel path. And we think of the travel path is attention, interest, action, to persuasion to purchase. So actually coming here. The implementation of the program, we see the implementation of the program in lots of places, including the ads I showed you before. But if you go to the Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism website, there are lots of pieces there. And you know we've seen the commercial, uh, we've seen the ads. So right now the Backyard Beckons ones are running. These are example of the various ads that are running out there that are really the implementation of the program. You'll find that the themes are consistent right across the board. How do you evaluate the effectiveness? Now, again, hard to find exact details on this other than to look at some of the reports that have come back from the advertising. Target has held Newfoundland Lab, Target Marketing, that is, has held a campaign since 2005. The request for proposals process is every five years. And Kelly says, Kelly is a representative of Target Marketing. Uh, they've competed against uh, Toronto agencies. It says, uh, it's really focused on the master storyteller, be able to build momentum with stakeholders. She touts Target success, like doubling the pop population in visitors, more than 530,000, 2.5 million sessions on the province's tourism website and helping drive $1.14 million industry. So we look at the tourism industry in Newfoundland, we say, yes, the value of it has gone up over the last number of years. That's, that's an example of evaluation. How many people watch the videos? That's an example of evaluation. The awards, that's an example of evaluation. When it comes to ad spend, Kelly says, given tourism is such a critical industry, the government has invested more this year in marketing than it has historically. And that's true, we see more and more put in. 
So that was an example of the application of this process. And, you know, this is a good example, I think, for the purposes of a business plan. This is the type of thing that a business plan needs to clearly articulate. How are we going to promote it? What are the methodologies? How are we going to evaluate it?